OK, we're recording again. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So in the last little video, we had a look at the, the data that we brought in in the, the prelim.csv, checked it out, looked for things like lipid effects, did lipid corrections, some of those sort of basic data summary functions, data plotting functions, things like that, identifying out outliers just to get familiar with your data before you start running and doing, certainly doing any data analysis or anything like that with it. In this next video, I'm going to talk through sort of the steps I use to generate basic stabilized at all biplots. And these are the typical things we see, but if we're dealing quite often, it's like carbon on the x-axis, nitrogen on the y-axis. Sometimes you might have hydrogen or sulfur or something like that, or there are other elements that, or other isotopes rather that you're, comparing them all. And visually plotting these out on a on a biplot can give you a first look at the data and you can sort of start to get some ecological inferences about your data before you move on into the, the more complex mo models. So what I want to do right now basically is just go through again working with the same data set and some of the basic sort of ggplot, things like that functions we've been using so far, plot out some of the data, have a look and start to see, can we start answering some of these questions we had about what's different between these two species of fish and how does the, the size of the lake that they're existing, coexisting in, affect what's different between these two species of fish. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. We'll do this as we did before. We'll share this entire screen here. And I'll pop that there down. Now we should be all set. So, so you'll see um, essentially what we're going to deal with here is just a continuation of the um, uh, the same markdown file that we had before. I haven't started anything else new up. We still have the same data in our environment. We've got the same data files and things like that up here. Um, yeah, and I think this is one of the things that I find quite nice about this approach is that you can just build everything together sort of step by step. So typically what we want to do here is to generate some plots and start looking at the data and looking for patterns and see what types of things are interesting. And this is the, a bit of script that I use when I want to do this. And so we've got the same type of thing, x-axis is D13C. Again, what you might want to do is change that to D13C core, the lipid corrected D13C value that we made up there. Okay, here we've just got D13C, but maybe that's something you can do. You can go and put that in and see how that changes what we're looking at. Um, y-axis, D15N, we're coloring them by group and shape by class. And remember there were those sort of different grouping variables that we talked about in one of the earlier lectures. Now we're just gonna plot the points. We're gonna use the facet function. Anybody who's familiar with ggplot knows about faceting or should, likely knows about faceting. Faceting, I love faceting. It's probably the, one of the, the things that made me switch to, uh, to ggplot. Um, and these, little bits of code here will allow you to put the uh, D13, so Delta 13C with the correct notation and things like that on the axes of your plots. So let's just run this script and have a look and see what we see. Okay, so the first thing we see, we've got all our data here and it's split. This is the faceting, we split the data or split the figure into two plots using the um, the facet, and we've got on the left hand side here, Lake Kiwi, and on the right hand side, Lake Vuontis. And we can see we've got some zooplankton here, these purple colored squares. We've got lots of invertebrates, which are the red triangles and squares down here, and they're separated out by littoral, so shallow water ones over here, and profundal, deeper water ones over there. We've got consumer fishes. Remember I mentioned here that we've got two different groupings of fishes, con consumer, so essentially they're feeding on invertebrates and piscivorous fishes. And what we see here, 
is the consumer fishes sort of sitting one trophic level above most of the invertebrates. And for the most part, the piscivorous fishes are at least at the higher end of, of this. Yeah. In Vuontas, they certainly seem to be in a separate group. In Lake Kivi, they seem to be overlapping and more on that soon, I guess. OK, so what can we tell about these data? By immediately just having a quick first look, we can see that there's differences in the two in the food webs of the two lakes. Yeah. Here, there's a very clear separation in Lake Vuontas between some littoral invertebrates and deeper water invertebrates who have carbon values that are more similar to zooplankton. Here, we look over here, we've got the zooplankton values around about minus 32, minus 31. Here, around about minus 30, close enough. But not as much sort of associated with them over here in, in Lake Kiwi. The majority of the fish are very much aligned with the um, littoral invertebrates and right the way up to the, the piscivores. Alternately here, we've got pelagic component, a littoral component. Even if we look at the fishes, you seem to have some fishes that are more so with the littoral, others that are more so with the pelagic, and then sort of the apex guild, for want of a better term, of uh, piscivores are kind of integrating everything at the, at the top of the food web here. So this is what I mean by spending some time to plot the data out and have a look at it and see what you see. Because without running any mixing models or calculating trophic position or anything like that, just by visualizing the data, we're already starting to get a little bit of familiar familiarity with it. Yeah, there's not there's a lot of things we cannot say. We don't know whether this is pelagic or benthic or resource use or, or whatnot because we haven't run the models yet. But we can sort of start to see about some of the things that are different among these two lakes. Uh, I've got some different bits of questions and things like that in here. Um, but I guess one of the things to to note is that there is a much, much bigger very like, OK, we said this is a much bigger variability in Lake Vuontis here, particularly in the, the invertebrates. And we want to understand why that is. And you'll remember when we looked at the, the data tab earlier, I mentioned that we have depths that the different invertebrates were actually sampled at. So let's have a look at that and see what that explains for us. So again, we're doing a little plot here. Um, using ggplot here, we're doing one just looking at carbon. Um, just looking at invertebrates, OK? So we're subsetting out invertebrates. X is our D13C and Y is our depth. And then we're going to run that through and have a look and see what it shows us. Um, OK, so again, we're split into the two lakes here. We've got Lake Kiwi, Lake Vuontas. We're going, we've got depth on the y axis here. So as we hear our invertebrates that were sampled at 10 meters depth at zero meters right on the shoreline. And the same thing in Lake Vuontas, but here we've got some samples down as low as 30 meters depth in Lake Vuontas. And what we see is as you go deeper, the carbon values shift. Carbon values become more depleted as you come, as you come deeper. And that's quite characteristic of lakes. And it's predominantly related to pelagic derived material settling on the lake bed and being incorporated by the invertebrates. Yeah. So as we move offshore, we're moving into a more of a pelagic type system. We sort of talked about this before as a, in terms of a uh, littoral profundal pelagic boxes. But as you can see here, it's more of a gradual shift. Next, we want to have maybe have a look at this in nitrogen and see how that looks. And Lake Kiwi, Lake Vuontas, again, much bigger range and depths in nitrogen. But again, what we see is as you go deeper, typically nitrogen values will climb a little bit. And this we're looking at invertebrates, just pooled invertebrates. And we could look at, we could pull out coronamids or a particular family or something like that and just look at those. But for now, here we're just looking at pooled invertebrates. And again, what we're, so what are we showing here? Why are we doing this? It's giving us some more information about what's going on in our, in our data. 
we're seeing, oh, well, there's a lot of variability among the invertebrates. What's causing it? Let's have a look at some depths that we might want to look at, the differences in lake size. Again, it's just reinforcing this idea that before we dive into the models, we need to spend some time visualizing the data, playing with the data, seeing, seeing what it's telling us. Next thing, and again, this is sort of just code that's in here. I've sort of presented this. This is some, something to note, actually, is typically when we see data like this in a, ta in a paper, it's means and standard deviations, and we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. But it's always, always worthwhile plotting out all your data points before you do any of that summarizing information, because there's always interesting stories being told by these data that you have to, <laughs> they're interesting, but you got to look if you're going to see them. Okay, so we've had a look, and now we want to generate a nice um, means and standard deviation plot for our, um, for, for our paper or whatever. And again, all I'm sort of combining some of the different things we've talked about earlier, making one of these summary tables, and then plugging this into a our ggplot script. So here we run through this. So there you see by pressing that little triangle, we run the uh, the entire code. So if we scroll down, what do we see? So, and again, we're just summarizing what we saw before. But we see our, our piscivores me, enriched in 15N over the, uh, the consumer fishes, which in turn are enriched relative to the, the sources or the invertebrates. And we see here in terms of carbon, kiwi, we've got almost a straight line happening here between our littoral and our fish and our piscivores. But in Vuontas, the, uh, the fish are kind of falling more so in between the, um, so here, sorry, I should have said here we've got littoral is uh, the triangle. Squares are the profundal, the deep water, and again, we've got our purple zooplankton. So more of a pelagic influence, say, in, in Lake Vuonta. So again, a quick and easy way to get a, a coarse initial understanding of what's going on in, in these lakes. So the next difference I want to know. The next thing we want to have a look at is the actual study species. And again, we can do the same type of thing that we've done here, where we're here, we're looking at the overall food web by just focusing in on our species of interest. And what we've done here, similar to before, subset to pull out the species of interest and generate the same plot. So let's click that and let it run through. Right, so what do we see? Lake Kiwi, Lake Vuontas. Whitefish, LSR whitefish are in red, perch are in blue. And we can see the difference between these two species in terms of their isotope ratios is really, really different between the two lakes. Lake Kiwi here, we've got whitefish and half the perch, say, are very much in the same space. They're all their isotope ratios here, around about minus 25, or carbon, excuse me, and around about seven to eight the, for the majority in, um, in white of whitefish, of all of the majority of the whitefish and half of the perch. But the perch also, we also see this other group in perch, which are enriched in 15N over whitefish. Switching to Lake Vuontas, like the deeper lake, with more of a segregation between pelagic and uh, littoral production, or at least components of the food chain, food web. And what we see here is we see that differentiation evident in the interactions between the two fish, where LSO whitefish and perch have similar nitrogen values, but are segregated, separated very much based on their carbon values, with perch showing carbon value, they're enriched in 13C relative to the white. And that's characteristic of something that's maybe a bit more littoral versus a bit more pelagic here. So what we can get from this is a really nice initial overview and a, a step by step sort of having a look and trying to understand it a bit more, a little bit more with, with each step. What we can't really do with this is talk about ecological processes. Are these consumers feeding at a higher trophic level than those? 
are these separated because they're pelagic versus benthic? All we're seeing here at the moment is isotope ratios. If we want to make those ecological inferences from our isotope data, which presumably if you're at a course like this, this is what that's something you want to do. There we need to take a step on and look at some mixing models and things like that to calculate trophic positions or to estimate resource use and trophic position and some of those more ecologically relevant metrics, say, from these data. And that is where we're going to go next. OK, so I'm going to stop this. Remember how. And I'll meet you back here in a moment for that. <laughs>